Now let's focus our attention on evolution in the vertebrates. In this, we're going to look at adaptations, and I want to draw your attention to the ever more complex environment that animals found themselves in. And we're going to use this as our series of signposts to go through the evolution of all the vertebrate lineages until we get to the humans. So, in this we'll follow a series of evolutionary innovations arising from moving from the oceans to fresh water, then from water to land, then further on to dry land, becoming active at night, then living in a three-dimensional habitat, Finally, how we rely much more on learning than on instinct. So, let's do that first step, moving from the oceans to fresh water. What's key about that, surprisingly, even though fishes still lived in the water, was that they needed lungs. And this will focus then on the acquisition of lungs in bony fishes. Some fish today have lungs and they use them to assist in absorbing oxygen. And these are called lungfish. The lungfish live in fresh water, and the value of lungs is apparent in fresh water because of drought. Ponds can dry up, rivers can stop flowing, and lungfish can then bury themselves in the mud, but they can gulp air because they keep their skins moist so they don't dry out completely, and they get just enough oxygen by gulping air into their lung to survive until the rains return. Now, in looking at the history of the fishes, we go even back before there were vertebrates. We had the lancelets that lived in the oceans. They have no brains, no eyes. And then they gave rise to the jawless fishes, which did have those things. And they gave rise to the sharks. And somewhere in here, the fish started going into fresh water, and we get the lungfish. We know they happened sometime after about 450 million years ago. Now, after we have the lungfish in the fresh waters, some of them actually returned to the oceans. They no longer needed their lung for breathing, but they kept it. And they retained the trait, which is now a swim bladder, that they used to assist in their kind of orientation and their buoyancy in the water. After this, about 350 million years ago, we have the first lobe-finned fish. And these will ultimately give rise to the amphibia. And these first lobe-finned fish we see with a modern example, the coelacanth. And the coelacanth then gives rise to the amphibia. So, what's happening here is moving away from water up onto the land. And the key thing here is the acquisition of paired appendages in the amphibia. The coelacanth are lobe-finned fishes, and they have quite remarkable physical characteristics that clearly ally them with these earliest amphibia. Here's one called meadow whatever, something pasor. It's an early amphibia. And they have these paired legs that allow them to walk away from the wet water itself. Now these lobe fin fishes are presumed to have come up on shore a little distance and they use their lobes to be able to get further away from the water's edge if there's food up there and abundance for these animals. And then these became modified to give rise to the legs of the amphibia. So, the coelacanth has always been a fish of considerable interest to zoologists. And early accounts of this were imagining that this fish somehow used its lobed fins somehow to do the equivalent of walking. And so this is an early book after they were discovered in the 1930s, old forelegs. But it turns out that coelacanth don't walk. They don't walk on the sea bottom. They never come out on land. But they do swim with their fins. So they swim in a very unusual way for fishes. They use those lobe fins. And the pattern of movement of those fins is a very characteristic alternating motion, so left, then right, and one after the other. And this is the same way that amphibia move their arms and legs when they're swimming. These photographs show an amphibia as it's in the water. Everything's been tilted, so you see the amphibia, so it's horizontal 
here on this photograph, but in fact, that's the surface of the water. And there's a mirror above it so you can see how its arms and legs are positioned. So as it moves along, it's got its front left leg here, and its right back leg, those are forward, and the others are back. Okay, and then they alternate. So now it's back left, front le right, and vice versa. So it goes back and forth, and they do that while they're in the water still, and now they've come out, and they're on the surface, and they're going up the ramp. And they don't change gait. It's still alternating left and right, front and back. Okay? So that's the way the coelacanth swims in the water. So that gait, that characteristic left, front, right, rear, forward, followed by right, front, left, rear, forward, is the same in the fish and in the amphibia, and that gait is assumed to be homology. Okay? Now, getting up on the land and having those lobe fins become elongated and then much more highly articulated, the fin of a lobe fin fish is pretty simple. There's a few bones in there that we might want to call like wrist bones. Okay? But we're going to have to get over here to where we have fingers, wrist, and forearm. Okay? And, or hind limb in this case. But what we have then is a fossil just found in the last few years up in northern Canada, which used to be a lot warmer. And this fish, I think pronounced tiktaalik, would have only come a little ways out of the water. And it has more bones in its fin that's more now almost like a foot. Okay. And so it's not hard to envision how we would get through directional selection on the ability to move ever further away from the edge of the water, more and more bones, so eventually we have proper arms and legs in an amphibian. Now, what's important to remember about amphibia is, yes, they can leave the water, but not very far. When frogs, salamanders, newts, spawn, they spawn in the water. Their eggs have to be kept wet at all time. And even though they can breathe in the air, a lot of them retain gills so they can breathe really well in the water. So these are organisms that must remain where it's moist for most of their lives, if not all of their lives, and only occasionally go just a short distance out from the pond or the stream onto dry land. So, if we want to move further onto dry land, organisms need more efficient lungs, they need a waterproof skin, and they need waterproof eggshells. And this we'll see in the reptilia. So here we have a tortoise, a turtle rather, a sea turtle, and it has an egg that is buried, it's in moist sand, but it's not in the water itself and tortoises can lay their eggs in the dry soil. The skin of the snake, as seen by our hero here, Nicolas Cage, in some rather sleazy part he's playing in some old movie, are waterproof, okay? And so you've got very tough hides. These animals can live outside the water most of the time. They don't have to keep them moist. So, if we look now at a lineage descending from the amphibia, what we're going to get from is something like this down here that still has gills to reptiles that are able to live on dry land. They have enlarged lungs, they have shelled eggs, and they have a waterproof skin. We have from this lineage here over to the turtles and tortoises where they have a large external shell. And then we have lizards and snakes. So these all are f have a common ancestry that goes up through here. Now, the lizards are the turtles' closest relatives, and the earliest turtles would have had a body plan much more like an amphibia, like a newt or a salamander or a lizard, and their shell derives from ribs and vertebrae that grew really quite extraordinarily large and then fused together. And so the first turtles only had half a shell, 
We once asked what use is half of an eye. Well, it's a lot better than no eye at all. Likewise with a turtle, what use is half of a shell? Well, apparently quite a lot, because the first turtles did have half of a shell. Here's the uh, actual bones from one of these, that we have the fused ribs in the front, and then the ribs in the back are not yet fused together. They're broad, they're spatulate would be the, the term there, but they're not solid, they're not fused together like a modern turtle shell. So a modern snapping turtle, those are still ribs out there, and they're now fused together, the bony structure links each one. So it's stiff, and it provides a shelter for the animal inside. Now, the other thing about these modern turtles is that they don't have teeth. So there's a lot of evolution that goes from these earliest turtles to the modern ones. So the oldest ones had teeth, and the modern ones don't. So these are fossil skulls of a fossil turtle, half of a shell, and it still has teeth. And the modern one has a much more elaborate shell, and it doesn't have any teeth at all. So, what about the snakes? They split off from the lizards about 92 million years ago. So they descend from animals that had legs. And the snakes first lost their legs about 92 million years ago. We've seen these vestigial legs in uh, the snakes before in an earlier lecture. But a big, big distinction between the snakes and the lizards is the structure of their skull. So in the same way that the modern turtle has a very different structured mouth with no teeth compared to its ancestral form that did have teeth, the snake's head is quite different as well. So lizards and snakes have rather large mouths, okay, it's true, but the modern snake has a much, much wider mouth. It has a very different jaw hinge way back at the back, much larger, that allows it to be much more flexible. So modern lizard can't open its mouth very far, and the modern snake is very, very flexible in comparison. And so they're able to swallow very different large prey compared to a lizard. Lizards go out and they eat insects, they may eat some seeds. Snakes can go out and they can swallow birds and pigs and people if they're big enough because their mouths are enormous. So that's their niche, was able to eat much bigger prey because of that adaptation of their mouth. Okay, so here we have our reptiles. They're living on land. They've got lungs, eggs, waterproof skin, etc., etc. Over in this lineage here, splitting off from the snake lizard lineage, we have the first dinosaurs. The dinosaurs then give rise to the crocodiles and the birds. We saw pedomorphosis earlier in the day when we looked at how larval forms are retained in the adults of descendant species, and we can better appreciate the linkages between birds and dinosaurs by considering one example of pedomorphosis in birds themselves. So here's a phylogeny that shows a lot of different dinosaurs uh, up at the top going down to birds at the bottom. And if we look at fossils of dinosaurs, infant dinosaurs, and even of these early birds compared to the adult forms of these same species, if we compare that to modern alligators, these obviously more reptilian forms of dinosaurs and modern crocodilians the infants are cute. They have kind of a round, bug-eyed face that's very attractive, okay, to us. And as they grow older, this is lost because the overall head shape gets longer and flatter, okay? It's just because various different parts of the body keep growing. But in the origins of the birds, what we have then is this early cute form of the round head is retained even in the adult form, okay? So the adult birds, modern birds, retain the skull shape of juvenile dinosaurs. So that's a form of pedomorphosis. Okay, so we've been looking at these different kinds of reptiles. We've gotten through the turtles, the lizards, the snakes, the crocodiles, and now the birds. 
now we're left with one more lineage that branched off a long, long time ago before the origins of most of these other reptiles. And these are called the therapsids. And the therapsids are key because they're going to give rise to the mammals. So the therapsids look a lot like dinosaurs. In detail, though, they are quite different. Uh, but they were quite a diverse group. Some of them were herbivorous. They ate plants. Others were carnivorous. They ate meat. And in these early therapsids, they had characteristic jaw bones that were made up of several different bones. Okay? And this is more like a reptilian trait to have multiple bones in the jaw. But as the therapsids persisted over millions and millions of years, eventually this just became one big bone. So it's a single bone, the dental bone, that comprises the entire jaw. So with the further evolution of the therapsids giving rise to the mammals, we see that all major vertebrate lineages arose within the first 200 million years of living on dry land.